power outlets in Denmark, are commonly seen as a happy face. I love this little fellow like you wouldn't believe. This church in Florida might remind you of something. From this angle, the windows and roof tiles seem to make it look like a chicken's face. This car might remind you of the nerd emoji meme. This hotel bathroom looks pretty surprised. This building looks like someone guilty giving a side eye. Two guys bring their friend who just got beat up. This house looks very glad about something. This doorknob has a pretty big nose. This rock formation looks uncomfortable. The reflections on these pots make them look like they're grinning. The shadows cast by these turtles look like a couple of old bearded men. And the shadows on this garage look like a guy staring at you. There are literally countless examples of easy to spot facial patterns in things. You've probably encountered a lot of them before in day-to-day -day life. These examples involve a type of perception called pareidolia, where you interpret some kind of pattern or object in a completely innocuous stimulus. Since facial recognition is so strong, a lot of the time this involves seeing faces in things. The word pareidolia traces back to Greek to mean beyond form or image, and refers to interpreting hidden meanings or patterns where there aren't any. If you look at the surface of Mars with a telescope, you might come across this creepy face. Some conspiracy theorists have speculated that this is an artifact from an ancient Martian civilization. But if you look more closely, under better lighting conditions, it doesn't look like a face at all. It's just a blip of elevation. The state of New Hampshire is home to this rock formation, referred to as the Old Man of the Mountain. It's become a cultural icon in the state and has been used on postage stamps and license plates. Unfortunately, it ended up collapsing in 2003. This rotating mask is very odd. It's the most famous example of what's called a depth inversion illusion. As the mask rotates, you see the inside of the mask. But rather than seeing the shape of the face as inside out, with the protruding features pointing away from you, it looks as if it's the right way around, with the features jutting out towards you. This also isn't a trick of 3D animation. Check out this video of a real mask rotating. The same effect takes place. There was a marble statue built in 2006 called the Concave Face by the sculptor Hilda Malum, which takes advantage of this effect. The face in the marble is hollow and inverted, but if you stand in front of it and move sideways, it appears as if it's protruding out of the marble. Apparently this works much better in person compared to a photograph. So why is all of this happening? It's important to remember that we aren't actually looking out at the 3D world directly. A two-dimensional image is projected onto our retinas, and our perceptual system reconstructs the 3D depth using cues like lighting, size, and importantly, prior knowledge about the world. Faces are really important to us. From the moment we're born and we look out at our parents, we're gazing at their faces. We spend a lot of our time looking at other people's faces, recognizing who they are, and trying to read what those faces might indicate about how the person feels or what they might be thinking. Since we're social animals, this totally makes sense. Our perception evolved to be really good at reading faces. We even have an area of the brain specialized for faces, the fusiform face area. In instances where people have had brain damage to the fusiform gyrus, which contains the fusiform face area, they tend to have trouble recognizing faces, a condition known as prosopagnosia. So in the case of the hollow face, there isn't enough lighting information projected on our retinas to determine whether the face is hollow or normal. It's like an ambiguous figure. Because we're predisposed to recognize faces, that process kicks in and we end up being more likely to interpret the figure as a normal face. Even though we saw the mask rotate and we know that it's hollow, we can't help but see it as if it were a normal face. If the mask is upside down, the illusion is much weaker, which suggests that it has to do with this familiarity we have with upright faces. Another interesting thing about this mask is that the illusion becomes weaker if you're under the influence of cannabis. About three hours after consumption, the illusion is at its weakest, and the effect continues even days later. If you consume cannabis regularly, the illusion will be weaker, even if you aren't currently high. The same thing seems to happen with alcohol. People who are intoxicated or going through alcohol withdrawal have a harder time seeing it. People experiencing sleep deprivation also have a weaker effect. This is likely because the top-down perception involved in the facial detection mechanism is dampened by cannabis, alcohol, and sleep deprivation. This top-down inference thing segues nicely into the next illusion, the Thatcher effect. And by that, I don't mean neoliberalism. If you look at these two upside-down images of Margaret Thatcher, they both look pretty reasonable. 
but when I turn them upside down, it becomes clear that the image on the right is actually grotesque. This is playing off the same mechanism that makes the hollow face illusion weaker when it's inverted. Our perceptual systems are tuned to recognize upright faces specifically. When they're upside down, we have a harder time telling them apart, because we aren't built to differentiate upside down faces. And similar to the hollow face illusion, people tend to have a much weaker response if they have prosopagnosia and can't recognize faces. You can also do some wacky stuff if you take advantage of our powerful facial recognition system. Consider this arrangement of gray blocks. It's probably obvious to you that this isn't just some random configuration of blocks. It's Abraham Lincoln. It's easier to see if I blur it a little bit. This illusion was first reported by Harmon and Jules in 1973. Three years later, in 76, Salvador Dali took advantage of this in his painting, Gala Contemplating the Mediterranean Sea. The painting is really big, 30 meters tall. Up close, it looks like a woman looking out at the sunset from her Minecraft house. But when you step back, or I blur the image on your screen, it turns into Abraham Lincoln. This mechanism is also why we can make faces with keyboard characters, like colon parentheses for a smiley face or a frowny face, XD for laughing with your eyes closed, semicolon parentheses for a winky face, and so on. When you open up the emoji menu on your phone, you're immediately presented with the emojis depicting faces. This makes sense, since face emojis are so disproportionately represented as the most used emojis, and is basically the reason emojis exist in the first place. Facial expressions are so essential to our communication that we decided to simplify and transpose them into text characters. It doesn't require the use of particularly complicated shapes to convey a very specific facial cue, since we're so tuned to recognizing faces. Artists have been taking advantage of this face detection for a long time. This painting, by the Italian artist Giuseppe Arcimboldo, is from 1566. It depicts a juror whose face is made out of chicken and fish. This artist was super prolific, and made a bunch of these types of hidden face pieces. This is the librarian from the same year, and depicts a guy with a beard made out of books. His painting of the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, was formed by fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Supposedly, these plants were chosen to reference the Roman god Vertumnus, the god of plants, growth, gardens, seasons, and change. He also had a series of paintings based on the four seasons, each made out of plants related to each season along with a series on the elements. Air, represented by birds. Fire, made of, well, fire and fire-starting things. Earth, made out of mammals. And water, made out of fish. Salvador Dali used this technique as well, in paintings like Apparition of Face and Fruit Dish on a beach. In the very center of the piece, a human face is clearly visible in the wine glass. And there's this other Dali painting, where you might notice a bust of Voltaire, made up of the people in the scene. This painting, called All is Vanity, from 1892, depicts a woman looking at herself in the mirror. When you step back, the white of the image forms the shape of a skull. Now this one has a skull hidden in a very different way. This is The Ambassadors, painted in 1533. The painting itself is remarkably detailed, and Holbin the Younger was absolutely cooking with this piece. It depicts two guys hanging out. It's so detailed that the globe and books in the background even have writing on them. But Holbin the Younger went even further than that, with the painting's hidden skull. When the piece was created, it was intended to be hung on a wall next to a stairwell, and it would be placed such that when you enter the room by going up the stairs, as you pass the painting from that angle, you see the skull. This technique takes advantage of anamorphosis. In order to see the skull, you need to be looking at it from a particular vantage point. The Mexican artist Octavio Ocampo used this effect quite a lot too, in some really cool paintings of figures made up of objects like this image of Don Quixote, made up of the two main characters and windmills. You'll also notice faces in the terrain and in the sky. He was a fan of skulls too, creating multiple emergent skull shapes in this piece. I like this one a lot. Two dudes sit in a room full of blankets and curtains, which form two elderly faces of a man and a woman looking into each other's eyes. He also created this piece of the Buddha's face, constructed out of a scene of people. A previous president of Mexico, Jose Lopez Portillo, also commissioned Octavio to create this piece of the American president Jimmy Carter. I find this kind of playful manipulation of our facial recognition really cool. Our cognitive systems are so efficient that they pattern match onto these emotional states and identities of facial subjects completely automatically, before we're even able to consciously interpret the visual information in the scene. The philosopher David Hume wrote about this kind of thing way back in the 1700s. 
there is a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves, and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted, and of which they are intimately conscious. We find human faces in the moon, armies in the clouds, and by a natural propensity, if not corrected by experience and reflection, ascribe malice or goodwill to everything that hurts or pleases us. This is usually thought to be a result of natural selection, favoring the capacity to identify mental states really fast. It lets us immediately recognize if someone is threatening, which gives us a chance to run away or attack much more quickly. The ancient humans that were good at this tended to survive longer and had a chance to reproduce, so this ability became more and more pronounced over time. Carl Sagan wrote about this topic as well, in light of the evolutionary theory that accounts for it. As soon as the infant can see, it recognizes faces, and we now know that this skill is hardwired into our brains. Those infants, who a million years ago were unable to recognize a face, smiled back less, were less likely to win the hearts of their parents, and less likely to prosper. These days, nearly every infant is quick to identify a human face, and respond with a goony grin. Faces are probably the easiest way to induce a paradolic effect, but it works for other recognizable symbols too. This rusted fire hydrant might remind you of a smug dog from a popular adult cartoon. The enormous popularity of Among Us during COVID resulted in a meme where people recognized the shape of the crewmates in everyday objects and symbols. Someone found a chicken nugget with a strange resemblance to an Among Us crewmate, and they sold it for nearly $100,000 on eBay. Pareidolia also resulted in a lot of instances where people saw religious imagery in ordinary objects. In 1996, an image that vaguely resembled the Virgin Mary appeared on a finance building in Clearwater, Florida. It was covered extensively by the media, and hundreds of thousands of people came to visit it. In 2003, the Virgin Mary also made an appearance in a fence in Australia, as well as a hospital in Massachusetts. She appeared once again in a grilled cheese in 2004, and a pizza pan in 2007. Jesus, who might be one of the most recognizable figures to ever exist, has also appeared in a number of objects, like this grilled cheese, Marmite, a tortilla, a Cheeto, and even a dog's butt. In 2005, the author and linguist, Karen Stolznow, decided to take advantage of these popular instances of religious pareidolia to pull a prank. At the time, the Pope John Paul II had just died. Often, when significant events like these happen, religious people make connections between them and miracles. When Mother Teresa died, there was a series of apparent miracles that occurred. Karen ended up manufacturing a pareidolic object of the Pope's face on a Kellogg's Pop-Tart. She called it the Pope-Tart. She wrote up a listing on eBay describing the item and its supposed resemblance to the late Pope, and also reached out to the seller of the Holy Cheeto to get his input. She wrote, what a remarkable item. I hope it goes to a deserving home. I too have been blessed by a visitation from our Lord. He replied with, What a great auction. I think you should write a press release for it. That's what I did with my auction. Best of luck to you. Within a few hours of her posting the listing, she received a number of replies. Some people were laughing about it and could tell it was a prank. Some religious people were mad about it and thought that she was just cashing in on God. Some people were frustrated and couldn't make out the figure of the Pope and some people did seem to be able to see it through the power of suggestion. At one point, she received an email from the Library of Congress, which read, The Library of Congress would like to archive this auction record as part of the library's research collections documenting the Pope and information about him on the web. She enthusiastically agreed and submitted all the forms to have it recorded. Ultimately, the Pop-Tart ended up selling for $46, and the stunt went on to become a slice of history. It's no coincidence that pareidolia seems to happen a lot in religious circles. A study from 2012 looked at the tendency to see human faces in objects and its relationship to paranormal and religious beliefs. It turns out that the believers were a lot more likely to identify faces in images and were more likely to attribute emotions to those faces compared to the skeptics. There are other characteristics that impact pareidolia too. First off, a study from 2016 showed that women are more likely than men to experience facial pareidolia. It's been understood for a while that women are a lot better at recognizing emotions and interpreting facial expressions compared to men, so it makes sense that their more refined facial detection system would result in more illusory faces. Neurotic people, or people in negative moods, also seem to have higher rates of pareidolic responses. 
This ties back to the evolutionary background that causes this effect in the first place. Neurotic people tend to have a much higher sensitivity to danger or threats, so they're more likely to have false alarms, where they perceive something as threatening, even if there's nothing to worry about. These are the folks who spotted the saber-toothed tiger long before the rest of the tribe noticed, and also probably had a lot of boy-who-cried-wolf situations, where they spotted a predator that was never there. This higher sensitivity to threats seems to have an overlap with interpreting faces, so they're more tuned to notice facial patterns in random objects and surfaces. Pareidolia also has variation on the autism spectrum. People with autism tend to have reduced responses to social cues and stimuli, so they have a harder time interpreting the subtleties of tone or facial expressions. As you might expect, these groups of people tend to identify a lot fewer pareidolic faces. In 2021, there was an interesting study that looked at the connection between pareidolia and creativity. They had people identify pareidolic patterns in photographs of natural landscapes, and then they had them do some cognitive tasks related to creativity, and did a short interview to see if they tend to identify as creatively or artistically inclined people. It turned out that there was a connection. People's level of divergent thinking, or creative disposition, seemed to be a strong predictor of their experience of pareidolia. So what do we do with all this? Is pareidolia just a fun illusion from an evolutionary byproduct, or is it something deeper? When you think about it, a painting of a human face isn't actually a face at all. It's made up of streaks of colored shapes on a piece of canvas that was put there with a brush. But because of the way these colors and shapes are configured, we interpret them as forming a human face. This is basically pareidolia, but instead of seeing it as an illusion or a cognitive mistake, we see it as a representation of something which is really there in the painting. The pattern of the face, in this case, is understood as real, whereas the pattern of a face on a mountain is understood as an illusion. But the same thing is basically happening in each case. We're imposing an interpretation of a face on the visual data we have, and in both cases, neither of these are actual real human faces. Humans have a pattern-seeking brain. A lot of the time, these patterns do seem to exist in the world as well. We've noticed the double helix pattern of DNA. We've noticed the Fibonacci sequence in nature. We've noticed fractal patterns in trees. We see the faces of our friends and family. These are all cases where our pattern detection is harmonious with the world. Pareidolia is pattern recognition too, but without the harmony. We see a face on Mars, but there isn't actually a face on Mars. The pattern in our mind does not have an analog in the world. But pareidolia is the exception. Usually, our perception and the world are in perfect harmony. We're always engaged in a dynamic interaction with the world, imposing and receiving patterns reciprocally. In some sense, pareidolia reminds us of our inner connection with the world. The next time you see a face in the clouds, you might be reminded that humans are not separate from nature, we're woven into it. 